Good morning, friends. It's Patricia Limbanda here. Welcome to the Cappuccino Club's social TV channel. An empowered woman is someone who knows her strengths and isn't afraid to embrace it. And we have been introducing you over the last couple of weeks to women in leadership in various forms and women who wish to inspire and empower to to lift as they rise. And it's been an incredibly, incredibly exciting journey so far. So I am Bridget Limbanda. I am a live video confidence coach. I host live video shows and help brands, entrepreneurs, thought leaders, social good initiatives, authors, um, and women in power to share their stories. I'm also very, very passionate about responsible social media. My co-host is an accomplished senior executive herself, it's Viola Manuel, and she was um, nominated for many awards. She was previously CEO of the Cape Chamber of Commerce and Industry, for example. She was also the executive director of the Cape IT Initiative, um, a member of the Western Cape Premier's Council of Skills, to mention a few. And she's also a non-executive at the National Sea Rescue Institute um, and is deputy chair of the Cape Town Stadium. She's got two entrepreneurial ventures and the one is called GNV Retail and Afri Wellness. But she always reminds me <laughs> that her, her proudest achievement ever is her son Shay. Viola, mm. hi. How, Hello. Are you? How are you? I'm very, very well. Thank you so much, so much for mentioning my proudest achievement. Um, yeah, it's not easy being a mom. I was watching a um, documentary the other day, and it was um, very interesting for me that um, I forget who it was that said, you know, uh, for the first first um, real test of leadership is motherhood. And I've really just had to take on that leadership role with much gusto because uh, Shay's 10 now and there's lots of talking, um, lots of opinions being shared as if they were fact. And, you know, we just have to um, manage that process, you know, and he's, he's absolutely the love of my life. He just keeps me really busy. So, yeah, thank you for, um, for acknowledging um, not only is it my proudest achievement, it's probably my toughest achievement as well. So. <laughs> Yeah, I want to. I want to second that one. You know, there's no, yeah. there's no, there's no user guide because each child is so unique and and different. Yeah, and I think that's an amazing dynamic um, to your ability as a woman to lead in business. Yes, when you have been able to mother a child, whether it's adopted or whether it's a natural yeah. child, but it adds an interesting dynamic to your ability to lead because I think a child um, has the ability to challenge you as a person yeah. in ways that nothing else can. And I think you can take that experience into the workplace and make it work for you because it humanizes whatever you've learned academically. Yeah. That's one component of leadership that they can't teach you at a university that that you it's a life skill you learn through being a mother absolutely absolutely and i also think just being a mom um, actually makes you a very attractive employee I, I don't know if if employers understand that because you are so you know you've you've got to be at work on a, at a certain time because you've got to drop the kids at a certain time you know you once you've dropped them you go to work you've got to get all your work done because at a certain time you've got to go and pick them up you know you just can't sort of be hanging around and not doing what you need to do because you know effective mothering also means that you've got to manage your time effectively and manage your time well um you know and i'm always one of those moms that are sort of coming around the corner at my son's school on two wheels you know just so that i don't disappoint him i just don't desperately don't want him to be the last one fetched from school because you know he she has that whole look on his face that says to me um why are you late what were you doing you know that kind of stuff you know am i not a priority anymore you know i get all that kind of melodramatic comments of <laughs> but um, yeah. I do think I do think it's it's quite challenging, and and I think one of the um, themes that have, has come through this whole leadership series is the the idea of you know as a woman you are expected to deliver certain um, things in terms of your performance, 
Um, I think each sector is very different. For me, one of the big highlights in the NGO sector, for example, has been the fact that you um, have to constantly prove yourselves to be, you know, worthy of the funding, constantly counting the numbers, et cetera, et cetera. And today we were hoping to um, host a program on women in leadership in government. And the fact that we actually don't have participants today is is quite a long story, but um, I think it speaks about it actually speaks about some of the challenges of being a woman in leadership in government. You know, um, one of the big challenges that the ladies were talking to me about was the fact that they had to get special permission to speak on this platform, whether it was in their personal capacity or not. You know, um, and I think that's one of the challenges is that, uh, you know, a leadership role in government is fraught with um, red tape. Uh, you know, oh, absolutely. I want to just yeah. quickly say welcome to all our viewers on LinkedIn, um, on yeah. Periscope, on Facebook. Um, on Twitter, and I see there are three people live watching us on on, uh, on LinkedIn right now. And I, you know, not to cut into what you're saying in terms of red tape. The other sector I found that to be true is the banking sector because I've approached so many people in the banking sector as well. Lots of red tape with transparency, and I yes. don't know why. You know, transparency yeah. is so 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 important. And talking about government something that i've not yet seen happening in south africa that i've seen is done very badly here um i don't think i've even mentioned it to you but in a lot of states in the us it's now become a uh, law to live stream their meetings wow it's, it's, written, That's it's written it's written into law to live stream their meetings why because it makes the it makes government more transparent I'm talking about municipal level. Oh. It makes it transparent because, you know, people in the community, um, those meetings are, je are open, but not everyone can be there. Correct. But if the meetings are live streamed, it's an interactive platform, unlike one way. T it's not the same you, when, you, when you're transmitting a municipal meeting uh, on TV, for example, because there's no interaction. It's just one Correct. way. It's spewing out information. But when it's live streamed, it's interactive and citizens can actually participate. So you're calling that a, a more inclusive way of engaging with your community. And I'd love to see that happening in South Africa. We can wow. do it. That that blows my mind because, I mean, just just trying to get the ladies. So so trying to get them to download the necessary app that we needed, you know, just just trying to get them to to um, participate. And again, you know, the emphasis is that you're participating in your private capacity. You're just literally going to be, um, you know, just talking to women about what your experience is in that um, industry just could not get done. It just could not get done. And then I think the second challenge for women in government, which I've now experienced trying to put the show together, has been the fact that every day things change. So, you know, there's just been so many challenges in, in um, specifically provincial government right now and national government with everything happening with the, um, the main opposition party. You know, you'd have them scheduled for conversations now and, you know, three hours or four hours before it's supposed to happen, people are calling you to say, look, we can't make it. We've been called into an emergency meeting. We've got to start strategizing. So, you know, it's it's really an interesting sector. It's really an interesting space to work. I think the public sector is is a very um, challenging space to work in. You know, they you know you constantly hear about red tape and you constantly hear about um, you know the bureaucracy, but you really don't realize that the bureaucracy affects the people working there as well, not just not just people engaging with them. So I you know I'm, I I struggle to see. Um, you know, just how some people can get around it. I must say I understand it. I mean, I, I I get the fact that you can't just be sort of allowed to download whatever you want to download onto a government platform. That's a dangerous space to play. And you and I know that the latest conversation that everybody's having around um, uh, your cybercrime is that cybercrime, you know, the user is held responsible. 
you know, you can't sort of blame the person that's that's uh, engaged in the criminal activity only. The user is now being held accountable for what you allow onto your plat, you know, onto your onto your devices. So I do understand it. It's it's not something that's not not understandable, but it it does give us a little bit of a glimpse into the world of you know working within government. You know, private sector. You just download whatever you want to. You know, you can sort of engage whenever you want to, but not necessarily in government. Hmm. It's it's an interesting dynamic, though, when you consider that the very leaders you lead in government, um, you know, you sometimes look at what they let out on social media and you wonder, is there any filter at all? <laughs> Correct. And and the thing is that it's it's at that specific level, you know, at the most senior levels, it seems that it's like each one to his, you know, like their law unto themselves. But I think in that middle echelon, you know, the sort of senior management or, or just sub supervisory space, I think they are burdened with uh, mm. tape and bureaucracy. Um, you know, one of the ladies was saying to me, you know, we can't only talk through our um, communications department. I needed to get permission from the communications department. And it was just, it was quite harrowing. I also think that um, we mustn't be naive. I, I also recognize that a lot of these women are inundated with um, emails and calls and people wanting to chat to them about some crazy brain schemes and so on. So, you know, even having to vet every conversation and every email you know a lot of our emails actually went unanswered a lot of my messages went unanswered and I, I i do understand that you know you they probably inundated with people wanting to talk to them so you know they, they look for the priority emails and sort of work through it whereas in the private sector that wouldn't work you know you never know where the good idea is sitting so you constantly like running through every email and, you know, responding to every email because you never know where the sales opportunity is, where the partnership opportunity is. So, you know, it's a it's a very interesting space. And um, I mean, many of us, even the ladies on the in the Women in Leadership for MPOs and NGOs were saying, you know, even their engagement with governments, very numbers driven, very report um, driven. And you understand, again, that, you know, it's stuff that has to be reported through to cabinet, you know, every hour that they are giving has to have some kind of influence on job creation, has to have some kind of effect on um, empowerment, you know, so they're constantly being pushed with these sort of KPAs, KPIs that they have to look at. So, you know, sort of, you know, sort of trawling through hundreds of emails, you know, with my little request, can you be on our show, sort of stuck in the middle of that email trail. Um, doesn't always mean that that email gets responded to, you know, at the time that you need it to be responded to. So, yeah, so we must, I think we must just apologize to all of our viewers that we don't have guests today to look at the whole um, woman in leadership in government. Um, it hasn't been easy to put that together, but I'm really excited about next week's show because it's going to deal with a social partner that's been conspicuous in its absence, and that is women uh, in leadership in trade unions. Um, I think they are a huge social partner that very often gets, um, you know, sort of tacked on towards the, you know, only because we must, um, you know, the engagement with them is always sometimes, you know, some people perceive it to be very challenging, etc. Um, but I know that those women, uh, lots of young ladies out there may not be considering a career in the trade union space, but it might be a very um i think uh exciting space to work in so we'll oh, find out more about that. i mean it's a part it's a part of the economy mm -hmm. um and it's a, you know i often say that about the informal sector and we seem to be dismissive of the informal sector yes. and it's it's a thriving part of our economy it's a huge part of our economy um and it's and it's driven mainly by women per se Correct. Um, the informal sector, you know, it's an unspoken of economy and some people seem to somehow think because it's informal, it's not real. Yes. But real money gets traded, you know, even if it doesn't go via the banks, it doesn't mean that it's not a transaction and that it's not business. It's a thriving yeah. uh, economy and, right. and, and, and driven by women who do phenomenally well. And I don't think we should be so dismissive. So I'm really looking forward to that conversation with women in trade, trade unions um, next week. And then also, but further down the line, um, I am extremely delighted about 
our conversation that we're going to be hosting in November. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yes, I'm quite excited about that as well. So Cappuccino Club has had um, three very distinct um, uh, sort of formats to our show. Um, the one uh, format was sort of the one-on-one -on -one interviews, which you conducted and did a brilliant job. And we met some really interesting women like Madeleine Gomez, uh, um, Gomes, and we met Donna po Podens, and we met some really good women. Yolanda was there, some exciting ladies. And then we've had these online panel discussions about women in leadership in that series. But our very first episode was a round table discussion. And that was so successful. Um, very interesting discussion. Um, and we had lots of women sitting around and just talking to each other about what it was, what it meant to be a woman in South Africa today. And I really was inspired by that conversation. I think one of the big take homes for me was the whole idea that, you know, initially about maybe even five, 10 years ago, when you were a woman in leadership, you know, you had to be quite strong and quite um, brash and, and, and sort of brazen and, you know, um, sort of a few rough edges and sharp edges to you. And you sort of walk and, into and it. I, I, I know. I, sorry to interject there. No, go ahead. I, I appreciated that a lot of the women there were saying, you don't have to become a man to lead as a woman. Yes. You can actually use your femininity um, yes. to your advantage because it adds a, a, a dynamic to leadership that the males don't have. Correct, correct. And so so that was the second sort of thing that, that I took home is that, that that brass and sort of aggressive leadership had been um, allowed a little bit of femininity into it. And we're not talking about a flirtatious femininity. It was... No. Uh, it was a it was a femininity that made you who you were because what we were saying is very often in boardrooms um you know i've had that experience where you are the only woman there and so you are representing a gender to the rest of yeah. the of the group you know and and you can't misrepresent or underrepresent that gender and we are girls and girls are girls and we do things a certain way and we approach things a certain way and to deny that is actually taking away from who we are and I, th I think the, 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 the sort of final blow for me in terms of the discussion, the thing that really blew my mind was that we was, that a lot of women were saying that the where we are now is that we need to be able to offer that leadership, be quite strong in what we do as women, and then also start you know, actively looking for younger women in the crowd, younger women in our space, younger women in our networks to mentor. And to open our networks too, you know, for me, mentorship without opening your networks is, it, it's just ineffective. You have to say to this young lady, you know what, I do know somebody in your industry. Here's the telephone number. Let me call them. Let me make a connection for you. I do know somebody that you can sell your ways to. I do have an opportunity to open a market for you to give you some market access. It has to happen as just like a natural part of mentorship. So um, that discussion was quite interesting. So we have another topic for the 23rd of November, which is going to talk about um, this whole issue of entitlement and privilege in South Africa today. Um, a a know, thorny I, subject, but a necessary one. Absolutely. Uh, and I don't think it has to be thorny. I think it's, it's embracing the cultures, the many cultures that we have in South Africa. Um, yeah. I think... I think it's finding ways of, of embracing it um, in a better way and, yes. and using it to our advantage. I, I, don't, I don't want to, to add a negative connotation to it. I don't think it has to be negative. I think it can be very positive. It um, be. Yeah. It could be, but, but right now it's a weaponized word. It's a, it's, a, it's a word that is used to punish and it is a word that's used to create negativity in the space. Um, I do believe that this whole idea of, of privilege, we need to start assessing quite caref carefully and not be naive enough to think that it's only economic privilege. And, and we shouldn't deny it. You know, I think that I think not talking about it is putting your head in the sand, mm -hmm. um, you know, denying its existence, denying yeah. how denying how it makes us feel. And to me, that's mm -hmm. the most important thing. You yeah. know, it, words are cheap yeah but you cannot ignore how words make people feel 
We need to yeah. acknowledge how people feel and how it impacts their their their, their daily lives. We must acknowledge yeah. and admit that. Yeah. So you know, I um thank you very much for the opportunity to just talk about it. I think that it's become quite interesting. Um, <laughs> We've got Afrikaans comment. <laughs> Lovely. I think I, that's our very first Afrikaans comment. I think welcome. I must translate that. It says uh, the person saying. This is a comment coming from a viewer on Twitch. Um, and in Afrikaans, it says, Dink Almal and said, Afrika moet ontspan. And a direct translation would be, I think everyone in South Africa should relax. Yeah. And I, I think I think the comment actually is very valid because we need to start um, de-weaponizing this word and actually start talking about how do we deal with this whole issue of privilege? How do we deal with this whole issue of that? And for me, it's not about anything else but emotional intelligence. How emotionally intelligent are we to start taking these conversations forward? Um, yeah. I think that's a fantastic um, topic that we need to add to our list, Viola. Yes. Um, emotional intelligence in women and how that benefits us in, in business. Yeah. So let's put that onto the, 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 the calendar as well. So for yeah. now, next week, just to quickly summarize, because I think we need to wrap this up. Yeah. To summarize quickly, next week is women in trade unions. Yes. And then we are building up for the, I think, did we say the 23rd of November? 23rd of November. November. Saturday, the 23rd of November at 9. Uh, okay. say and are all, our, are all our slots are all our slots filled yet, or always do we still have one or two openings? We have one or two openings. If anybody is interested in participating, any of the ladies are interested in participating, they can contact us. Okay, Perfect. fantastic, fantastic. And my goodness, it does it get any better? Now I'm I'm going to put myself on a limb here. I'm going to say that this is probably our first causa comment. Yay! Well done! Oh, that's awesome. That is so awesome. Can you translate that one? No, I'm afraid <laughs> not. I, I really wish that at the time I was at school that we were forced to learn a third language. Yeah. So I'm a little bit challenged in that and I apologize for that. Um, okay. But thank you for that comment. Thanks so much. Thanks very much, Brigetti. We'll chat to each other really, really soon and I'm looking forward to next week. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. See you next bye -bye. week. Have a fantastic day from Cape Town. It's goodbye for now. Bye.